The primary purpose of Innovative AAC Solutions, the podcast, is to educate and inform. The views expressed during all episodes are solely those of the individuals involved and do not constitute educational or medical advice. They are not necessarily the views of Special School District of St. Louis County. Hey everybody, welcome back to Innovative AAC Solutions. I'm Laura Hayes and this is my wonderful counterpart. I'm Cheryl Livingston. And we cannot wait to have you guys back for another week. Another, I just like, I feel like I keep saying this, but I'm like, oh, there's so many great resources in this episode, Cheryl. Yeah. Yeah. In fact, I was uh, kind of previewing just to make sure I knew everything. And I was like, I can't keep up. I can't keep up. So we're going to be busy just getting them all organized to to share. And so sharing wise, I'm sure you have a fun find. It's yes. Clear. Yes, yeah. Yeah. Okay. First of all, did you give me permission? To I share? sure did. I remembered. <laughs> and I say, I've always, I, usually we talk about this before well, we start. And I forgot. And for, first, first, can you tell where I'm at this week? Oh, that's a very interesting Colors and shapes of stuff that hmm, I'm not sure if everybody's familiar with that yet or not, because it's definitely, I think if you got your students pulled into the room, they'd recognize it. I don't know if some of us old ladies like me would recognize it, but I do because I, I've seen it on computer screens at home. Mm -hmm. So as promised, I've been in a new place every episode this season. So if you can be the first one to email Cheryl or myself and let us know where I am this week, then you will get some lovely AAC swag that you can adorn or use with a student, something fun. But okay, back to our fun find, Cheryl. What do you have for the uh, listeners this week? My first question is, did you make any New Year's resolutions, Laura? (laughs) Surprisingly, I didn't this year. (laughs) I think I chalked it up to saying I have two kids. Like that is plenty. If I could just keep my life together. What about you? No. And that's what I said. I've been doing this so long. It's like, no, it doesn't, you know, and they were talking on the radio this week about how this is about the time people kind of start falling off of their wagons or whatever they've, you know, decided it's going to be their thing for the new year, but let's not make that an automatic. So I'm going to share my, um, desktop here and I wanted to make sure you guys all knew that again New Year's resolutions are meant for all kinds of reasons so uh, the AAC coach has given us a chance to say you know with our students let's make some resolutions so happy new year and here's her list so I think this might be a nice little graphic to print and hang up someplace or laminate it and put it with your you know, ID badge or whatever, but let's make sure we do think of these things throughout the year. So we want to presume confidence. We want to provide robust AAC. We want to prioritize communication autonomy. Our guys, all of us want to speak for ourselves. So let's make sure we give our kids a chance to do that. Model with ex- without expectation. Celebrate the small successes. Be kind to yourself. You can't know it all. But all you have to do is reach out and somebody can help you and just keep learning. There's all kinds of information out there that we just have to, you know, be open to. So I thought that was a nice way to, for for our students' sake and for our own, we could make sure we cover all these things throughout the next year. Yeah, I think this is important because I think that a lot of times we assume that the barriers are technology or student related, but would you say, Cheryl... Would you agree that the majority of the time the behaviors are related to mindset shifts and environmental barriers that we're seeing that we just need to try to help communication partners feel more confident and comfortable with things so that they can see that success, see the power and see all of these things? Yeah, no, I I feel like we put a lot of onus on our kids to make it happen on their own, but it's all about how we present the the opportunities, how we engage with them, how we connect with them that makes it so important that they they want to communicate. And that's where um, it's not about the devices. It's not about the the um, technology of, well, how do I find this? Or how do that? It's just about having fun and being there. So I think um, we, you know, we, we could be so much, re- we could be more relaxed and the, yes, they'll learn along the way. Well, I love that. 
mine is something that you could use to go along with that. My teaser is back to, you know, I'm a data girl. Like I, I do like me some data. And so I found from Katie Hartstring, strong, Katie Hartstrong, she shared a free resource that is a, both a lesson Ooh. plan and a data sheet. And I'm obsessed with it. So I had to come on here and share it with everybody because it really fits all of the things, all of the language processing styles that we're talking about and thinking about. Um, it supports all the areas of linguistic or about of competency when we think of AAC mm-hmm. device. So if we look back at Janice Light's competencies, we've got linguistic, operational, social, and strategic. So you can highlight that, like what are we targeting, kind of keeping us in check as clinicians. Um, simple, target met, target missed, and those can be just plus minuses, right? Mm -hmm. Are we having to use prompting? And I love this, like, wait 10 seconds. Like, are we doing that? Right. Um, And it's, are we giving aided aided language simulation and modeling first? Right. I I just kind of love this. All the way down to the tap. So does the tap mean tap on the device or the tap the elbow or tap, you know? So yeah, there's things that we do that we, we want to make a note of that. Yeah, good. Mm-hmm. We've got the activity. We've got the words that we're modeling, what they, what skill or what words they modeled. And what I love about this is that if they're not activating symbols, we can still talk about, well, they oriented to the device or they calmed their body when I modeled, when they were frustrated mm-hmm. or they got engaged in the activity they referenced the activity or whatever is being modeled about like these are things that we can still Mm -hmm. talk about as a skill even though they may not say something on the device so i love that Mm -hmm. open-endedness there Mm -hmm. it goes through all the functions it goes through other methods if we're seeing like other ways of pre-symbolic communication which gives us data for later and then just general what worked what didn't ideas for next session and this is something that i'm like oh this could even be shared with you know, a sub, this could be shared with a parent. Um, mm-hmm. It's just, it's just amazing. So she gives an example on her Instagram, but then she gives this as a free resource that you can download. Okay. So Cassie Hartstrong, wonderful, amazing resource. If you're looking for a new data sheet for AAC, I think this is your girl. Yeah. I love how that's, to me, it's a com- combination of all kinds of things all in one place. And that is priceless. Because if nothing else, it's a trigger for my memory to be like, oh, yeah, I can I can give him credit for, you know, an active gaze. I can give him credit for and something that I might have. Yeah, I knew it, but I didn't document it. So I love that. That's wonderful. She's very detailed. Well, and it's simple. It's simple, but detailed. Right. Yeah. And, and I'm like, yeah. oh, and like maybe if they're if we're missing something that shows or maybe we haven't had a way to gain attention. So then it helps me as a progress monitoring tool, too. Yeah, I just. I think it's a winner. So definitely yeah. check that out. We'll put it in the show resource, like show note resources. Mm-hmm. And then um, and then you can write to your heart's content. And so, you know, we writing is a very important skill, written expression and being able to share what we know. It's a form of AAC. And so I thought it might be important to bring someone on that could help us better understand how writing and AAC intersect and intertwine and how we can really support our students with complex communication in written expression. So Cheryl, does anyone come to mind when you think about that topic? Well, so over the years, I think I've heard Kelly Fawner speak on that several times. Perfect. Well, I was hoping you would say that because that's who I corralled to sit down today. I, the wonderful Kelly Fawner, she's an amazing resource. This is a, a topic that she is amazing to listen to on and she just is very passionate about it. So we sat down and we talked all about written expression and AAC. I can't wait for you to hear it. I think it's a good one. Without further ado, let's lead into our interview with the wonderful Kelly Fawner. Hey guys, welcome back to Innovative AAC Solutions. And I am here with the infamous Kelly Fawner. Kelly, how are you today? Well, hi. Thanks for having me, Laura. I'm doing well. We are so excited to have you here. I can't wait to unpack alternative pencils with you. And that is the topic at hand. I mean, you have endless amounts of knowledge and ideas related to AAC. Um, Before we jump into that topic, would you just do me the honor of letting our listeners know a little bit about you, a little bit about your background related to AAC and uh, any other tidbits you want to share? 
Sure. Well, I think the endless amount uh, and ideas, uh, AKA you are old. Right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so just to let people know, yeah, I've been a teacher since 1983, since before many of you were born. Um, and have been doing this and stuck it out because I'm one of the, I feel like I'm really one of those lucky people that found a passion and was able to roll with it in lots of different situations. So my background is as a special education teacher. I taught in early childhood settings, which really got me up and rolling. I worked for an Easter Seals program and became the, what was then called instructional media uh, before the term assistive technology was coined. So yeah, I, I had, I group. didn't know there was a name change. That's a fun factoid. So I was that and, and turned over kind of from being a, a teacher into being a related service person in assistive technology and always working with um, students who had uh, physical challenges. And then a majority of those students had communication impairments as well. So I was always working in some way of assistive technology and was also very fortunate to be in on the ground floor when the state of Pennsylvania started doing training in like 85 or 86. And we had grants that we could write as classroom teachers and therapists, grants that were for your classroom. Um, and then there were in, in the 90s, there were individual grants for students. So we were able to get a, our hands on technology really early, which helped with what we were learning. And we had great people at our state level that were training us. So people that many of you have probably heard of, like uh, Karen, can I name somebody? Yeah, yeah. Uh, Karen Kangas, yep. um, Susan McCluskey, Colleen Haney. I mean, we, and then all the people that are still around today Linda Burkhardt and Caroline Musselwhite and Gail Van Tatenhove. So all of these people I've known and have learned from and had the fortune to work with um, for a long time. And you also have a connection to um, one of our favorite people, Kathy Locke, as well, because you guys have done Quiet together for, for many years. I just wanted to plug that as well, because I know you guys worked hard together on that. Yes, excellent. Yeah, I've known Kathy. Well, I've been in in the quiet leadership team um, for over ten years, and so yeah, it's a it's a nice collegial organization to be a part of. I think um, from from teaching, I worked at a state project, so I worked at the state project in Pennsylvania for about ten years. Um, I did some doctoral work at the University of Wisconsin Milwaukee, so I worked under Dave Eddyburn and and Roger Smith, so on um, Project Adam, some people know about in assistive technology. And then I, instead of finishing my PhD, I'm one of those, I'm a quitter. <laughs> I'm a quitter. Um, and instead I started my own company. So for the last almost 25 years, I've been an independent consultant. So I do training, consulting to districts, programs, agencies, um, families, um, and companies in assistive technology. And now I also am back to teaching that in addition to my training, I have kids on my caseload that I see throughout the week. Oh, all my so students, fun. I see distance learning wise, that they're all being homeschooled for various reasons. Mm, maybe we'll have to unpack that if it, if it comes up too. I would love to know how that's going for you as far as the distance learning piece, especially with one of your passions, which I want to jump into, which is just alternate pencils and the entire idea of alternate pencils, how it relates to AAC. If someone hasn't heard that term alternate pencil, can you tell them what does it mean? I should be reading this out of the book from Karen Erickson and David Kovenhaver because they've got it defined in there. But alternative pencils came about from the work of the, you know, where we first kind of heard the term coined, came out of the work of the Center for Literacy and Disability Studies with Dr. Karen Erickson and, and Dr. Gretchen Hanser. So Gretchen is a, an occupational therapist who works, you know, primarily with kids with, with uh, physical challenges and communication impairments. And was they were looking at a way to get access to the alphabet for all children. You know, many of us for a long time were using what 
some of us might call electronic alternative pencils. So other kinds of keyboards, on-screen keyboards, um, enlarged keyboards, miniature keyboards, so other kinds of technology. But it also, you know, became aware to people like Gretchen that everyone also needs a low-tech way, a no-tech way to write, that we can't always be dependent upon technology. So many of us have kids that we're, we might be working with eye gaze systems, and a part of that process is getting them access to an eye gaze activated keyboard. But what do we do when, you know, their body's not working so great that day or the technology's down? So the idea of alternative pencils is typically associated with strategies of having an alphabet layout that somebody points to um, that, or having an alphabet laid out that a partner to that student or that individual um, then scans visually, auditorily, both, um, presents somehow the letters of the alphabet to a person who selects that alphabet using their voice, maybe using their, um, you know, a, an eye blink or any type of way that's that's the one I want, you know, something that exactly. indicates that. Yep. So you'll see alternative pencils that might be the letters A through D, and then you flip and it's E through H and you flip and then it's I through M. I feel like I need to do the whole alphabet. You all know the alphabet. <laughs> <laughs> but it is, it's important because the layout might look differently to help with someone who has alternative access. So if you have someone who's scanning, um, we don't want to scan every single letter of the alphabet, right? We want to make it a little bit more organized so that they're more efficient so they can have more opportunities to practice that. Exactly. Yeah. And I well think said. And well, and I was going to say, I think one of the things you highlight so well in a lot of the presentations you do is, is the idea that um, we all, most people, you know, may not think about that. We all kind of develop a, a writing um, format. We have opportunities that we don't necessarily think of for someone who uses AAC, namely opportunities to scribble and to just see writing in form and to learn like this is this is um, a writing sample that I have. And, and that might look different for someone who's using an alternative pencil, but it's still important. So let's unpack that a little bit. Why is it important? You know, if we have, we have access to the keyboard on an AAC devices, why is that not enough? Well, and I think I mean, sometimes it is, that's the keyboard that somebody's going to use is the keyboard that's on their AAC device. But I think part of the what's not enough is that people forget the scribbling aspect that you mentioned. Right, like they forget that just because I'm presenting somebody either through technology, low tech or high tech with an alphabet that that child that's gaining access to it doesn't have to immediately type their name, right? Like that we, we tend to, when a kid is presented with an alphabet, get right into typing whole words and then typing sentences. And we forget that there's a whole developmental process that isn't just about getting a letter on paper, right? That it isn't just about handwriting. There's that mental act of writing that develops also through the scribbling process. I mean, scribbling provides so many different needs to the writing where somebody's learning to use their pencil by scribbling, not being asked to write anything that's legible, not being asked to write a whole word. Um, and so the same thing hap should happen with our children that use alternative pencils. They need time to scribble with the pencil of their future. So that if you know they're gonna be using an eye gaze alphabet, I don't just wanna have to put this alphabet in front of them and immediately they're typing words, but let's just, hit letters, you know, hit on letters and groups of letters and learn how this thing operates before we're in a situation and even better, let it develop naturally for a child to go from scribbling to kind of all these stages that we see kids do where they'll find a sound. I had a student today 
that's been using, you know, an alternative pencil for quite a while. But where she was decided to talk about her love of um, distance learning. It was a very interesting topic for a student to pick. But she did, as she was trying to spell out the word distance, did a D and a T. So she hit words that had those sounds. And she's been working on phonic activities and all kinds of things, but we're letting that happen naturally for her. So she has times that she whole word writes where she's doing emails and answers to questions in school. But when we're doing independent writing, she's doing that letter by letter through the alphabet. Wow, that's interesting. I love the the point you hit on that she was kind of allowed to um, illustrate the topic that she wanted because so often I think we get into this pattern of, of it's our curriculum, it's our presentation of the information and they have to either spit it back or they have to show some level of demonstration of knowledge. But what you just highlighted is a great example of she is motivated to write and to talk about this because it's, it's her, her choice. Um, so even having that opportunity, offering that opportunity for our students, I think is great. Um, and then you also mentioned that it wasn't perfect, but you were able to show that she's developing some of that graphemic understanding of I've got a D and a T, so it's probably distance and it might not be perfect, but what are some other, are there any other, um, you know, because our, our teachers are always like, okay, well, what am I, how am I going to embed these opportunities in the classroom? Like what, what would scribbling even look like? Um, what are your thoughts on that? So those kinds of things that, you know, the motivation piece and making it fun are really important. And Dr. Janet Sturm, who does a lot in the area of writing, you know, she's a, she primarily talks about writing with students with the most significant disabilities. And she talks about the fact that because it's so difficult it needs to be fun, right? Like it, it needs to be um, decided from the child. It's a child-led activity, which means we don't set topics for our kids. So these are some of the barriers that we have created that we didn't know were barriers. But when you have students where you know everything that they've written has been redlined or it doesn't look right or somebody is recopying it because theirs wasn't good enough or you couldn't read it janet warns us that anything that you do like that is all that's going to do is discourage kids and so for some of us that have older students on our caseloads and in our classrooms we are combating against all of that baggage um, that kids have about writing, like we're going to write today, uh, you know, like, no, but like, oh, I don't, what are you going to write about? I don't know. You know, like they don't have the idea of topic. So it's really important to develop those things. So we do activities around just choosing your favorite topics and not even having to put letters on the page. Um, let's just do a whole lesson on how do we pick topics and how do we brainstorm ideas around topics? And there, there are some curriculum out there that can really help. There's the first author curriculum from Don Johnston. And yes, I do do training. I do not get money for people buying first author. Uh, but it's one that I found it's very open-ended. It has lessons that you can do as a teacher. But it also gives you that guidance of what are some of these stages that kids are going to go through, right? So they have a 14-point developmental scale. And I've been... Um, doing a series of webinars with the uh, Crick software on how you can do that with some of their tools and go through this scribbling to paragraph writing using things like Clicker and all of the different things that are built into Clicker, like keyboards and word banks and um, using images and being able to paint and make books. So, I mean, giving kids that opportunity to choose what they write about. And then from there, start to make their mark, whatever that looks like and however that's done. If it's done with an alternative pencil, you know, if it's done with an electronic keyboard, Janet talks about giving kids multiple options. Many of us change writing tools. Exactly. Right? Exactly. Like I move from uh, well, writing with a Sharpie, writing with a pen, typing, I type on a laptop, I type on an iPad. So we need to give our students this 
wealth of opportunity on how this text get made. Yeah, I, I think that's such a great point, right? Whether we be using magnetic letters, whether we be using their AAC systems, whether we be using, I've seen Plato or foam letters that you can create um, and, and you know, you shape it a little bit. Oh, that kind of looks like an O. <laughs> um, just giving that opportunity to, to scribble and to manipulate if they have um, that ability to access it motorically, the, some of those manipulables I think is super helpful. And um, I love the idea of using a scale, whatever writing skill that you might be familiar with, whether it be the Don Johnston, we do have Cric software um, and clicker supports here in the district. So you guys can always reach out to your facilitators for that. But um, what about, what would you say Kelly to, as far as different alternative pencils for, for different ages, right? What about someone who, you mentioned some of the older students that are having to unlearn the, uh, not what we won't call it trauma, but just like the adverse nature of wanting to write because it hasn't been very fun. Um, do you recommend different alternative pencils for them? What does that look like? I think a, a lot of alternative pencil pieces are, it, it's very highly customized, right? That's if you if they go to the website of project dash core so project core is typically known as a you know communication training in core vocabulary but the, it's tied together with literacy so how do we work with our kids that use communication systems to teach them to read but also how to teach them to write and there is a link to 36 or so not to be too specific um alternative pencils right that they've created different color contrasts, different layouts. So a lot of times the experimentation is moving through. So it's not like I have recommendations of with this child, with this disability or this child of this age group. I mean, I've seen uh, one of the things that uh, Janet's term has shown in webinars is a student that was an older student um, who through everything. So anything that you handed to that student got thrown. So what they did is they gave that student a basket of foam letters. And as the student threw the foam letters, <laughs> I'm not recommending that everybody does this, but this is, you know, desperate situations, you reach desperate measures. And as that student threw the foam letter, somebody else would call out the letter and then write it up on the whiteboard. And so that started to grow their interest in, oh, well, these letters mean something and they can be interactive and other people can be a part of this. And so then they gradually moved from throwing the letters to picking the letters out and putting them on something, you know, that transfers into things like magnetic letters. And then magnetic letters, and I can take a picture of what it is that I wrote today. Somebody doesn't have to transfer that to typically looking print, right? That it can, my print is what I produced and how it looks. We do a lot of photographing of exactly of what it is that kids have produced. And that's their writing of the day. We don't transfer it. We don't rewrite it. I don't write underneath it. You know, if I have to, if they're telling me what it is and, and it's illegible to me, I'm going to put it on a post-it note and stick it on the back or write a note, you know, somewhere else. I'm not going to put it side by side because I've seen kids erase what they've written. You know, when a teacher has gone and written underneath it, what they said that those letters were. And then we've had a student, one of the fun activities we do with kids in their writing is author's chair, where they share, they, they either read it aloud, they pick somebody else to read it for them, even if it's just a whole lot of letter T's. Um, but I've seen a student come up to author's chair and the only thing that was on his paper anymore was the teacher's writing. Mm -hmm. And she was shocked. And when she said to him, what happened to what you wrote? And he said to her, you know, it wasn't good. But what remained was what she had rewritten. So, uh, you know, lesson learned. 
hard lesson learned. So powerful. I think that's a good reminder because we have good intentions, right? But if we're doing things like hand over hand or even hand under hand so that they do it quote unquote, right. We're losing that autonomy, right? We're losing that, um, that understanding of this is mine, that ownership of, of it's nobody else's. It's what I came up with. So, oh gosh, I think that's such a, a important point to, to note. One of the things that you mentioned was author's chair, which reminded me too of the, uh, of the idea of how do we embed this within group instruction, right? So we do want to make sure that every, we consider individual preferences, whether it be foam letters, or if they have a high interest in magnets or whatever the case may be, we want to, we want to include that. But uh, you mentioned author's chair. I'm thinking predictable chart writing. What, what other group activities are good for instruction for alternative pencils? So with alternative pencils, you know, thinking about um, how can I share? Like, what's our ultimate goal of writing? Our ultimate goal of writing is to share, whether I'm sharing knowledge, whether I'm sharing my ideas, you know, whether I'm trying to share to influence people. So there's all those different types of text that as teachers and and therapists that we need to get kids involved with, opinion writing and descriptive writing. So, you know, trying to keep your eye on those types of things and then that it doesn't have to be a particular writing ties to a modality of writing. Um, but with that, and, and, you know, some of the practices that where people share, I have kids that are doing emails, right? So they are using, and I start to distinguish between when are we using whole words? So when do I, especially for my students who have AAC systems, there are times that we do whole word writing, like when we're writing emails to people, when we're answering questions and doing, you know, things in science and social studies and English lit class and those things where I'm writing answers or I'm writing a report, those types of things. But when I'm writing my own ideas, we're doing letter by letter writing. So activities such as like you had mentioned um, predictable chart. So predictable chart is really about language. Like predictable chart isn't about teaching kids to spell. It's not about teaching necessarily the conventions of writing. It's about how do I add my language into something that's being written, which is typically the writing that happens in predictable chart typically is happening from the adult in the room right, that it's not a student produced. So what students do is they add a, a measure of language to a predetermined sentence starter, right? So you get lots of different ideas that way. Um, and then in the, if you go through the five-step process, you'll end up everybody, we make a book. And, and so that's, that's a great activity, but I think people need to keep their eyes on the ball that that's about language. And a language experience part of writing, it's not necessarily an alternative pencil activity, right? Yeah. Usually kids are using their whole words to produce those things or either saying them aloud or saying them from their device or such. Yeah, I and think so, that's a great distinguish. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so I think, you know, when we do writing, it's just knowing why you're doing what you're doing, right? Mm. Yeah, I hear you saying kind of distinguishing them, but but also um, kind of seeing the big picture, zooming out, zooming in, um, and and really understanding. Okay, what is our goal for this? What are we really trying to help teach them, um, and making sure that we're teaching them, and we're not always asking for demonstration of knowledge, giving them right. those opportunities, um, and not yeah. always being asked to like write some narrative. You know, I have kids that just want to keep writing the same letters over and over again, and you'll see some really nice examples from Caroline Musselwhite with getting kids to write poems and haikus. And so see, letting them see, let's write a list. You know, we're gonna go shopping to do it. Kata Hearn does this a lot with her online or her Academy students where they're gonna be doing um, a cooking activity and then everybody starts to help write the shopping list, right? And so that they've got that. So. We need to expose kids to all the different purposes that we write for. Mm. I completely agree and think that we, we could definitely do a better job. Do you feel like there's any other challenges when it comes to embedding opportunities for emergent writing in the classroom or any other pitfalls we might see? I think the, the big 
biggest pitfalls is people fall into the conventions trap, you know, and that's one of the things that, that David Copenhaver talks about is that everybody, you know, mm -hmm. people tend to fall into that. Is it capitalized? Are they using spaces? Are they using punctuation? Did they put that in a sentence where we really need to be focused with the emergent literacy group about the language and the interest and the motivation and the getting them up and running with an alphabet. I mean, that time spent to figure out what alphabet's going to work. I mean, I've done things with some students where we're just looking at the color skin of, of the keys that they're using. Like, are you more motivated to write when all those keys are blue or all those keys are purple? Like, well, and I'll look at that and see, boy, you know, there, I got a lot more letters out of this student with the multicolored keyboard, or I got um, beginning words with a student when the vowels were colored one color on a keyboard versus another. Um, and so those kinds of, that's really, that's great time that you can do while you're doing the activity of pick a topic and let's write about it. Yeah. Yeah. And one of the things, and I, and I want to make sure we don't skate over this because we do talk about it in a few other episodes when we talk about emergent literacy, but for someone who hasn't read compre comprehensive literacy for all, or is like, well, wait a minute, what do you mean when you say emergent literacy? Like we don't necessarily, it, we don't want or expect our students. They don't need to understand all 26 letters before being exposed to literacy and writing. Right. Any of you that have been around a baby <laughs> that, it, you know, a child that is typically developing in the writing area where, you know, at what age do they start holding a marker or start playing with markers and crayons? And nobody's expecting that nine month old or that 18 month old to be doing that. I have a four year old granddaughter. She's still not making letters yet, but she makes marks on paper with lots of different things. And nobody's screaming that she doesn't write her name yet, right? Like, but we tend to get impatient when we do this with emergent writers. And then I also get where people say, well, no, I don't think my student is an emergent writer yet. Guess what? You come out of the womb an emergent writer. Like it's, there's nobody that is below the emergent writer. You are an emergent writer or we're, we're on and past that. So uh, as much as people I know will, will cringe when I say, I mean, well, I'm talking about the kids that would rather eat the paper than write on the paper, right? Like the paper doesn't mean anything to them. You know, it's something, it's a tangible paper is something to crinkle and do sensory stuff, you know, to mouth to do all these other kinds of things. And so that's what we're talking about when we're talking about emergent writers. I'm not talking about, as, as Laura said, kids that know their alphabet. Karen Erickson even talks, defines it out like they might know most of letters on most of the days. That to me is a beginning writer, right? Like that's, <laughs> that, you know, most of your letters on most of the days, we are moving forward with the, you know, the writing process rather than being like an experimental and, experiential um, aspects of writing. So, sorry, I get a little excited about writing. It's my thing. It's been my thing since I was early childhood teacher. And I just really like getting people interested in and to know that there is always a way to get somebody to write. Yeah. Always. Yeah. And I hear you saying there's no prerequisites. There's nope. no, there's nobody that this doesn't a, apply to other than someone who might be mo doing more conventional style writing yeah. strategies yeah above and beyond okay. yeah yeah over overachieving as we like to say um what about somebody who we've we've gone we've thrown resources at you in this um and kelly you've been so gracious to like just cite so many different people that are, are really leading the field with lots of ideas and resources any other ones that we haven't hit on if someone's like oh my gosh i love this i want more I think, you know, go to the AAC in the cloud. Um, so that conference has been going on for what, five years now. And there have been many sessions on writing. So some topics I've, we've, I've done a scribbling topic with a colleague of mine, Donna McNair, who works with individuals with vision impairment. So we've talked about scribbling. I've done a session just on showing alternative pencils. There was a session, I think it was last year that um, a group, 
from Ireland did on all pen alternative pencils that were eye gaze related. So you'll find some really great examples. Um, somebody's done you know, that whole, we talked about um, doing so well. Um, already? We talked about predictable chart and there's a presentation. So that's a really nice resource um, for you to get, you know, 45 minutes of ideas um, on different parts of writing. Jane Farrell has been there and talked about using the developmental writing scale from Janet Sturm and using the whole first author approach to writing. Love it. Um, okay, so I don't, we gotta, we, I was gonna say, we gotta land the plane at some point because we could talk about alternative um, pencils and, and writing with our students with complex communication needs all day. Before I let you go though, Kelly, what um, what would you say if you have, if you had to tailor it down to one, is your favorite AAC moment so far, thus far? Well, my favorite AAC moment related to this topic, because there are many of them, yes. is when a student realized, so this is a student that's an eye gaze user, so we'll name the technology so people kind of get an idea. So she's got a, a Toby eye gaze system that runs the grid language software and she's using pod on um, the pragmatically organized dynamic display system as her AAC language. When, when she realized after she had told us that what she wanted to tell us was not on her device, she went to the alphabet. And what did she spell? <laughs> <laughs> what she wanted. Did she, did she, well, tell you? Know, she was trying to tell me that I had noticed that there was something on her shirt. It was a, a toucan bird that was on her shirt and I was talking about it and wanted to find out about it. And so she wanted to tell me that it was a toucan, but she did not have that specific word yeah. in her device. Sure. So she went to her alphabet. And now this student uses both an electronic eye gaze alphabet and a partner assisted scan alphabet. And she will flip between the two of them based upon how her body and her eyes are at the moment. So she got out the strongest sounds, which was not the T. She got out the O sound. So there was an O, two, she put in two O's and a C and then a U and an N and then went back and got the T. And there might have been a letter B in there somewhere too. Like just like a, B for a bird. bird. Yeah. 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 I'm with you. I followed. <laughs> but that thing. was just, you know, like, dude, she's got this. Like she understands whether she can spell the words or not. She understands that this thing that we've been doing for two years, writing with alternative pencils, is something that she can use as a communicative tool. And when you hear, you know, adult users of AAC systems talk about how can you say whatever you want to say to anyone, it always is that they're using their words, they're using their pre-stored messages, and they're using their alphabet because that gives you the ultimate access to anything you want to say. And so to see somebody young starting to develop that was a very cool moment. Yeah. And it's the autonomy piece, right? We have to give them access to alternative pencils to have the autonomy piece and exactly what they want to say. She didn't want to say parrot. She didn't want to say bird. She wanted to say toucan because that's what was on her shirt. And that, that was so specific. Oh, I love that. Mm, yeah. what, a take, what a great take home message, Kelly. Um, okay. So, so I guess we'll just, we'll just stop there because again, I think that's such a great highlighted point uh, of, of what we want, what we want for everyone that we work with. So if someone has a specific question though, or, or if they, you know, we've highlighted resources, we'll make sure to add those in the episode notes. But if someone wants to reach out, what's the best way to do that? To reach out to me? Yeah. Or if they have um, a specific question. Yeah. I mean, the best way to reach out to me is um, look at Twitter, you know, things that are going on in Twitter, look out for, I've got a website, so kellyfoner.com, um, and you can link to various emails and all those other components that you're looking for. Perfect. I'm around. <laughs>
she's around and uh thank you for your time today it's just been a pleasure um just this topic is one near and dear to my heart too so we just want to thank kelly foner for her time thank you guys for listening and uh, we will check you next time for innovative aac solutions i'm laura hayes thanks kelly you are welcome right on everybody Hi guys, it's Cheryl. So Kelly Foner was giving us some resources when she was talking with Laura and I wanted to make sure you had a little more information about some of the places you could go to find more information about uh, alternative pencils and different ways to um, work on writing with our students. So she mentioned Project Core. So their website is project-core.com. And I am on the independent writing facilitated module. So when you do professional development, um, this is their, their screen always has the same headings, professional development, one of the modules that you can um, watch, there's a video, is called independent writing facilitated materials. So you can watch this video, it's about 13 minutes long. And they're talking about you know, ways to engage the student, things you should, uh, would be helpful while you're working with the student. So it's a, a nice overview. And they show some examples of um, alternative pencils. Well, in this video, they also reference, so I'm gonna click over now to the dynamic learning maps. And um, they encourage you to look at another module that's on this site. So this is DLM, as in monkey. P as in Paul, D as in dog, dot com, Dynamic Learning Maps, PD. And then I am going to go to the module called Writing with Al Alternate Pencils. So it's dlmpd.com, Writing with Alternate Pencils. And there's a video that you can watch here too. So again, lots of good information. Um, it starts with um, overview. But I'm going to show you as you work your way through, you know, there's there's the photos of different types of systems. So, um, again, great information. So then they um, have, you know, handouts that you can uh, download. There's, you know, all kinds of information there. So then from there, um, I was looking at different other sites and I found this one on um, weebly.com. It's alter alternative pencils.weebly, W E E B L Y.com. And this is another great, just oodles of information that you could look at um, overviews, files you can download. Lots and lots of uh, videos to watch. Okay. And I'm scrolling back up to the top here. I'm going to click on more. And then it's some more videos. But then there's also a list of things about meaningful writing activities. So there's handouts that you can download. other resources um, and then again some suggestions creating and using remnant books for self-selected writing so when you're watching the the previous sites that i was talking about videos they talk about you know let's give our kids a chance to pick a topic and and these could be different things that you might um you know do to give them a, a way to to have a motivation you know to write some to write about something that's meaningful to them uh, al alphabet scavenger hunts, words about things I know, um, tongue twisters, playing Wheel of Fortune or Hangman, um, write picture captions, start a journal. And again, the journal can be images. It doesn't have to be all um, of a written text. Sign your name for real purposes. Okay, so again, lots and lots and lots of things to, to choose from here. Picture prompts, language experience charts, sentence frames, um, your favorites list. Give me five books you like to read, food you like to eat, things you like to do. Rewriting predictable story patterns, weekend words. 
stealing letters, read it back, give feedback, give video feedback, and another game of uh, Hangman. So while I was scrolling through this site, I was also looking, there's, again, they've got information about research. It's so all kinds of uh, research projects that have been done over the years. So those are resources for that. And then I think I was over here, what are they? Um, at the bottom, there was one of these, there was more links. So one of the links here took me to the UNC School of Medicine. So their website is med.unc, University of North Carolina, edu. And they have a section of their site for alternative pencils. So again, there's all kinds of pictures and actual downloads to help you create these low-tech writing tools. So whether it's an eye gaze frame, which would be something like this one here. So they give you instructions on how to make the frame and then they give you the printouts for the letter combinations. And then there's the flip charts. So all kinds of things are waiting for you to just click on download, read, share, and get started so that uh, everybody is having an opportunity to write and share what they're thinking about. Okay guys, so for this week's innovative activity, we are gonna talk about some sensory play. Most of you, you, you're probably one of those people you either love sensory play or you hate sensory play. I'm gonna tell you why you should love it. It is so engaging to an, just hands sense sensation of just tactile feedback of, um, motivation of the sounds and the feels of things. Uh, I love it. And I'm going to show you a quick example of how we can use sensory play in conjunction with just emergent literacy and, um, a, as a writing activity. So I have here, this is available for checkout in the IRC. These are washable sensory play materials. It is a big old box of green beads. They're about this size. So again, this would not be something that you would wanna do for someone who is going to put these in their mouth. Um, but perhaps you do something like rice or beans instead that you have washed and, and cleaned for those students in case they um, need something that would be edible or non-chokeable. But in this case, we have found some green sensory beads. They're plastic, they're easily washable. And these beads can have anything inside them, right? We could put, if we're doing a thematic unit on springtime, we could put different flowers. We could put different baby animals that might come in um, the sun, right? And we could describe those as we pull them out. We could uh, hide them and say, where is it? Or what is it? Maybe we feel first and we don't have our, all of our senses think like a black bag. If you don't want a big box like this, sometimes they'll just use a black bag that is felt that they can feel inside. And Ooh, what does that feel like? Is it hard? Is it soft? Is it big? Is it little? What is it? Is it a horse? No, horses don't fit in bags. It's not a horse. Is it a baby duck? <gasps> yes. You know, and you can even scaffold that to make it a little easier by showing them the items you're putting in beforehand. Or again, if they're used to the activity, maybe you sh uh, shift it. And so then they don't see the items beforehand. And you, this is a really great activity to just to work on yes and no. Um, if you really want to work on yes and no, make it more fun, make it engaged in play where it's, they're just trying to figure out what it could be. Um, if you don't even have a bag, you can just put two items behind your back and you can say, is it a cat? <gasps> no, it's not a cat. Is it a bird? <gasps> It is a birdie. Yes, it's a birdie. You got it, right? Uh, you can do that same thing with colors or shapes or sizes. Like you can work on all of those things just from other senses. But what I want to show you today is the idea of sensory play with 
an alternative keyboard. And when we talk about alternative keyboards, we're really talking about having access to all the letters of the alphabet so that we can explore them, so that we can scribble and do some of these emerging writing activities um, that will help us learn literacy. And you might think that your students, oh, they're never going to learn that. Um, don't sell them short, right? The only way for us to have true spontaneous language and to tell someone what we're thinking is to have literacy and to be able to build those novel sentences on our own. So expose them early. Um, literacy for all is a great resource that we'll talk about and just know that that is that is what we want that's what we strive for for all of our students so this is a really great activity where they can explore letters and just write something on a page as they pull them out so let's say we our letters in and we pull out an s s snake Ooh, snake you said you pulled out the sound okay so we're going to write that on our board Ooh, now we've pulled out the Oh, ah, ah, or oh, so these do not have to make sense. This is just exploratory play, right? Oh, it's the t, t the t, the t, t, s, ah, t, sat, sat. That's a fun word, sat. So you can do this just for a few minutes as they're playing, um, just for exposure. And again, just some pre-scribbling writing activities. This is just such a great fun activity. Um, you can do it pretty much with anything, but I love it. Love it for um, just alternative keyboard access and scribbling. So uh, we have a couple of them available in the IRC. Check them out or make your own. Like I said, there's some really great recipes uh, online where you can do sensory sand, um, edible rice, things like that. Enjoy. Cheryl, what'd you think? I loved it. And okay, I'm, I'm gonna, it's, this is true confessionals, right? I'm one of those old SLPs that I, I, you know, I appreciate what writing is all about, but I, I was putting my emphasis on communication. And so kept thinking, well, we'll get to it. We'll get to it. But now just listening to Kelly, it's like, no, 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 no. <laughs> they, they go side by side. There's not first then. It's going to be something that we have to A, expose, but then B, make it fun. And I love I love how she talks about scribbling. And I love how she talks about the, all the fun things that, you know, the kids are going to be excited about. And yet I took it as too much of an academic task, I guess. That's where my brain went. You're going to learn to write. And it's like, no, you're going to learn to put stuff out there. And then we're going to share and figure out and you know, just it's a team effort rather than putting all the onus again on the kids to to make it happen. So, oh, she's good. And I love listening to Kelly. She's always enjoy it. It's it's always something I enjoy listening and, and smiling along with her. And I think the aha for a lot of people will just be that it's not something you have to get to. Like it's something that evolves, just like communication evolves, writing naturally evolves. And you should see they need that time to explore, even if they have a complex body, even if they don't look like they're interested in writing, they need time to explore what written expression looks like and the power of that. So then it can emerge to more opportunities to want to write, to want to explore alternative pencils and letters and things of that nature. Um, just like we learn through movement, right? Our kids need yeah. movement to learn. They need opportunities to write in these fine motor opportunities, drawing, scribbling. They need all of that to develop written expression. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that's a big aha. And I hope it's a big takeaway for everybody listening today is that yeah. don't wait until they, you think they're ready for it. Start them yeah. with the process and they'll get there. Yeah. And, and it's exposure, exposure, practice, practice. It's just all together. And I love, I love the mindset of just the flow, you know, just make it happen. And we know communication wise, if you are using a communication system and the word's not there, that's the next step is to spell it and to generate some letters to get your message across. So our kids need this. It's not a, it's not like a, like side thing that, oh yeah, that would be nice. But it's like, no, no, it's, it's a necessity. So I, and we, I need to put that first. And we touched the iceberg today. There's some really great presentations Kelly has done for other conferences. I know there's some free ones in AAC in the cloud, and she's done some through mm -hmm. other, you know, through Closing the Gap and ATIA. Like she is a wonderful resource on this topic. So 
you know, if you want more information, definitely dive into um, the, the channels of learning on on this area because it's, I think, it's such an important one. goes hand by hand, hand in hand with communication and hand in yes. hand with literacy. Yes. So, uh, okay. Well, I think that wraps us for this week, Cheryl. Okay. I don't think I missed anything, did I? No, no. And again, we're, we're information is flowing. That's right. So we <laughs> hope that this information has helped you continue your AAC resolution. And we will be back in the month of love, the month of all things... What is February? <laughs> the month of the longest, shortest month of the year. We will be back with all kinds of new AAZ resources for you. Yes. And we hope that you guys stay warm out there. Maybe a few snow days in between now and next uh, next time we, we chat. So for Innovative AAC Solutions, I'm Laura Hayes. And I'm Cheryl Livingston. See you next time. Bye.